Hello everybody, thanks for tuning in. You're about to watch a video of me doing a demonstration at Corning where I do the very large Marini pickup to make a blank um, that I will then uh, use again at a later date to make a much bigger form. I'm looking forward to speaking to you. If you call in and ask me questions, we can um, chat about the process or anything else. So take care and talk to you soon. Bye-bye. All right, good afternoon and welcome to the Corning Museum of Glass here at the museum and at home. We are live streaming this afternoon. We have a guest artist, Yanush Pozniak. How about a big round of applause? And he'll be making a few pieces um, during this live stream. We have the Corning home team. We have Chris Rochelle and Tom Ryder. They'll be helping out. Uh, my name is Catherine and I'll be narrating, and if you have any questions, that goes for you at home as well. If you have any questions, we do have someone, a moderator here to uh, um, let us know those questions as well. So feel free to shout those out at any time. How many of you have seen a show called Blown Away on Netflix? Show of hands, yes, all, most all of you. If you have not, now you know. Go home, check it out. It's a really awesome competitive glass blowing um, show. Yanush took part in that show and um, has been blowing glass for over 30 years. And now with this um, new attention to his work and his skill, uh, he's here with us at the museum doing some demonstrations. And we're pretty excited to have him here. He's been here for the past uh, two weeks. So one week he spent in the back shop prepping um, cane, prepping Marini. So a lot of his work, and you saw a little bit of this on the show, um, a lot of his work has this beautiful cane and Marini techniques involved. And so cane would be these stripes or rods of glass which you have to pull. And that's actually what he's doing right now. He's gonna pull us, uh, while we're waiting for this Marini roll up, or Marini um, plate to warm up, he's going to pull some cane, which is actually pretty exciting because he's going to stretch glass from the back of the amphitheater, the front of the amphitheater, to the back of the amphitheater. And so your best place to view this is either gonna be over here on this side. Um, you'll be able to see him kind of run through. Um, but if there was somebody that was really interested, you could make your way over to this side or watch from above. Oh, and so we are, that's right, we are live streaming. So that means we have a live cameraman on uh, the floor this morning, or this afternoon. And he is going to go to the side of the stage and film. So you'll be able to watch from where you're sitting. Um, with the beautiful camera view. So here we've got, you picked up a little chunk of color? A, a little chunk of black color, and then there's some gray color in the, the color furnace over here on the other side of the stage. So he's got black running down the center, and then a beautiful transparent gray um, on the outside. Now with some canes, you would pick up a color on the inside, and you would gather a couple times in the clear, and that would give you the spacing the clear spacing to make that beautiful lattice pattern or that reticello pattern um, that Yanush is uh, very fond of making. And so for this, um, he could certainly make a reticello piece out of it, but he's probably going to use it for something else. Um, there's some, a few pieces up here on the table and this is what essentially what we're going to be making um, for the live stream, and it's this uh, cup, this Marini sort of grawl cup. And so it's got this beautiful Marini pattern. And in each one of the little Marinis, there are these lines or dots of cane. So he takes the cane, once he pulls it, you're gonna see him pull it. Then he's going to bundle it up just like this. Then he picks it up again. Probably he'll add um, you know, another color over top of it. So in this case, he's got some gray with a, a thin layer of an orange color, a saffron color. And then 
pulls it again. And so the idea is you get this really beautiful sort of kind of uh, dotted line look, which is really quite amazing. And you can come look at these pieces uh, up here a little closer on the table. So some of the pieces he's been working on. Uh, this is the Marini. If you can, you might be able to, re once you come up and look a little closer, you'll be able to recognize it in this uh, pattern here, a little celery shape. So Chris has made what's called a post, and this is going to allow them to stick up the two together and pull it. So it's basically like, like a nice hot game of tug of war. They're going to be pulling. Um, but because this glass is hot, they're not going to have to pull very hard. So this is not going to be a very, uh, it's not a competition game of tug of war. It's just going to be, both of them are going to be tugging on either side to pull a nice long cane. So Chris has already gone backstage. Maybe Eric's back there and can get some footage. Yanush, what you'll see him heating and shaping the glass a few times, and then you're going to see him run backstage, and they'll stick the two together. All right, Eric is all set up in the hallway, so you'll get a nice view of this. So once he gets that glass hot enough all the way through, You'll see him run back here, and they're gonna, he's going to let it drip onto the post that Chris made. So he said he needed another heat. He wants the temperatures to be even all the way through. And so if Chris's um, piece is not hot enough, the two won't stick together. And so he, Yanush told Chris to come on back and give it a quick flash. And that flash heat is what's going to allow the two to stick together. So timing, temperature, and teamwork are all really important. You'll hear us talk about that quite a bit um, if you've seen any of our demonstrations or live streams. All right, so Yanush is getting this as hot as he can get it. It's moving around, but not out of control. He'll come out. He'll run back. He'll let it all drip onto, watch this. Oh, that's a great view, Eric. Thanks. He'll let it drip onto the post. They stick it. He pulls it. He stretches it. See how it's like this hot um, kind of gooey rope. It'll be a little hard to see. Now they're starting to slowly pull. And they will pull and stretch this. He'll make it all the way to the back wall. So one step at a time, pulling and stretching. Now, after pulling cane like this for you know over 30 years, he is probably one of the best. He's, you know, if you saw someone else do it who had less experience, you'd see what would look like a snake belly with its dinner, you know, thin on either end and a big lump in the middle because you don't have that heat just right. But you can see it's a really even pull. And you can see it's still glowing back there at the end. It's darker here. It's looking gray. It's looking cold here. But back there at the end, and there's the piece from Blown Away. <laughs> Some of the glass from the final show, Deborah. 
the two finalists, Janusz and Deborah. We have um, pieces from each contestant on the show on one side of the amphitheater stage, and then we have some of the work from the final episode on the other side of the stage. So if you're curious and want to see some of that, I'll break it free. I think on this side we have, so he pulled the cane. How about a big round of applause? <laughs> and he stretched that and pulled it all the way across. And he has done this probably 20, 30, maybe 40 times just this past two weeks. Way more than that. More than that, yeah. Way more than that. Probably um, about 10 a day. So I've just got to pass uh, a few minutes by here because that plate that we put in has got to warm up a little bit more. That was a, uh, I kind of smiled about it, but that's catastrophic what happened there <laughs> 15 minutes ago. So that's pretty sad. Um, so my whole live stream plan is out of whack now, but it's not that big a deal. We can fill in the time. Um, so I just need that plate to warm up a little bit more. I don't want the, the, uh, the Marini to start exploding as we travel across the hot shop to get to the glory hole over there. So has anyone got a question just to pass a few minutes? Yep. Uh, it's, it's small enough that the inside and the outside don't cool at such a uh, different rate and it, it'll, it'll stay together. And also, be, be, if it's that thin, well, pulling any cane sort of self anneals in a way, because you, as you stretch it, all the molecules actually are stretched and lined up in the same direction. So that's what I was told once. Sounds good to me. So, um, but if it's if it's thicker, we do anneal the cane, because the inside stays hot for so long to relieve that stress. Any any more questions? Nope. Come on. Uh, he tr he he's usually down there uh, a few times a week. He just you know he says oh, I want to go blow glass. You know and he pretends to blow glass. So. Oh, uh, whenever he wants to. I mean within reason, you know. Um, but oftentimes he just wants to play with the tools and turn the pipe. Not often he actually has hot glass, but he has cut hot glass and marvered hot glass already. It's pretty. It's, he's, he's really got it down. It's gonna, if, he, if he stays interested, he's going to be good. But probably lose interest, you know. We'll see. Question for you. What is your favorite piece that you made on the show? The favorite piece I made on the show was probably, um, probably, I guess, the hairbrush. Um, the f I like I liked the, uh, the piece about family, too. Um, but the hairbrush, I misunderstood the challenge. And... Uh, so sort of had to invent the hairbrush like in seconds, basically. And it turned, it was just a miracle that I could think of something without just scratching my head like crazy. Um, and then it turned out w pretty pretty well, so I was really lucky. And and uh, and the wonders of glue holding that thing together, it's probably still not all in one piece. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, well, I think we'll get going on that plate now. All right, thanks, Yanush. Yeah, the hairbrush was, I think, my, my favorite pieces that you made as well. I thought that was pretty, pretty creative. Um, so for those of you who have not seen the show yet, it's a show um, kind of like a competitive cooking show or Project Runway or something like that where they would have challenges each week and then each week one of the glass artists goes home. And so um, it was a fun, each, each episode they had different judges. And so they had a ballerina as a judge, they had a sommelier as a judge. Um, and so it was a really interesting show. So if you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend watching. My only complaint about the show is they did not show enough glass blowing. I don't think the show was long enough. Some of those reality shows, they're an hour long. So if you know, n anyone at Netflix is listening, we'd like a longer show <laughs> because this is a pretty fun process to watch. And um, 
you only get to see just a short snippet of it. But for those of you here today, you're going to see quite a bit, all of the action. So here is the plate with all the marinis laid out. So it took about probably two or three hours just to lay out the marinis. It's two of those celery um, slice shaped marinis with one clear um, cylinder in the middle, in the center. So it kind of fits together like a big puzzle. And the less space, the better. Because this is going to be the walls of the bubble. And if there's any little spaces, that leaves room for the air to escape. So now their job is to condense this down into this really tight pattern. And so if you get a chance, come down and check out some of these cups. And this is what we're going to be making today. It's one of these cups. We're not going to make a finished piece today, but we'll make one of these cups. Because making just one of these cups takes um, a couple hours. I mean, many hours of prep work to make all the marinis. It probably took, I don't know, f 10 hours, if not more, just to make just the marinis. And then to lay them out, it took a couple hours. Now to roll it up, it's going to take a couple hours. And then, after all that work, then you have to make the piece. And I don't know if any of you have seen glass blade before, but sometimes things can go <laughs> terribly wrong. And so making work like this is extremely challenging and stressful because you make a piece, but you've put so much work into it already, and if it doesn't turn out just right, then um, all that hard work is still practice, but you hopefully you want something to come out of all that hard work. But Yanush is an excellent glassmaker, and um, very rarely I think things go wrong. So. When we have a small kind of roll up or something, we'll take a couple of these little steel taglioles and we'll squeeze the glass. Now, you can see how big that plate is. If we took a tagliole, two of these, to squeeze the piece from either side, it would be very hot on your hands. Your hands would be really close to the hot glass, but it would also take a long time. So they've got this technique well, they're going to take um, some of this, and you'll have to excuse me, I'm not sure what it's called. What's the angle iron called? Angle iron? Angle iron, yeah. <laughs> so I had a feeling, but I wasn't completely sure. They're going to take these two pieces of angle iron, and Yanush and Tom are going to squeeze from either side. And so it gives them that extra leverage and allows them, and they'll do it kind of a little bit at a time all the way around so that this stays nice and round. And this is a setup for a pickup, a plunger pickup. So here they go. They're going to take those two pieces of angle iron and squeeze. See how it's slowly kind of compressing and squeezing together? Because they took all those extra heats and warmed up the center, it's all kind of squeezing at a nice even rate. The edges are not squeezing more than the, the center. It's all kind of compressing. And that's really what we're looking for. And they're going to compress that a few times until um, it's of just the right sh size and shape, and there's not a lot of space left. Again, they're going to rotate the um, plate a few times. And that's to ensure there's an even heat. It's like when they do a pizza in the oven. They usually go in and they turn the pizza a couple times. They want that even heat all the way around. So you could imagine this like a big glass pizza. And because this is such a big piece of glass, we fired up the jumbo hole. This is our largest glory hole. There was a, f um, from the show Blown Away, they had um, just one size oven. And it was a, f a fairly small size oven, but there was one uh, episode where the oven was too small or the piece was too big. 
But uh, here at Corning, we have quite a few sizes of the oven. This is a smaller setup over here. This is our assistance bench. So this is one of our smaller holes. And then our everyday hole, which is the large size hole, which is, we were using this morning, we've turned it off. And then over here, we only light this one up a handful of times throughout the year. When glass artists come in, they wanna make something really large. And so when Yanush came and he said, where's your biggest kiln shelf? And we showed him and they laid out the plate and then they realized it was not going to fit in the large glory hole. So they had to then wait for that um, project till the next day when we could light up the jumbo glory hole. So it has one more set of rings on there, but for this piece, we won't need those extra set of rings. This is perfect. We have a nice little view. We have a camera that sits right behind the oven, looks through a little window of a special type of glass called fused silica, which was developed right here in Corning, New York, the Corning Glass Works, which is pretty exciting. It has um, been used in the space shuttle's windshield. It's used in the optical fibers of fiber optics. And we use a little piece of it in the back of that oven to see what's going on inside the glassmaker's oven, which is something you don't get to see in most hot shops around the world. I don't think anyone has one except for um, us here at Corning, which is pretty special. And that's for you to see what's going on. Otherwise, you get to stare at the glass inside the oven. You're going to see what's going on inside the oven. So this is a nice way to see what's going on inside the oven. All right, so they've squeezed and pressed this. It's getting smaller and smaller. It's not going to get too much smaller. They're probably going to just compress it a little bit more. And then Yanush will start up the plunger. So um, it's just like the plunger you would have at home, but made of glass, so it's that shape. And what they're going to do is try to match the outer ring of the plunger to the outer size of the um, plate. So he'll take a couple measurements of that, and then he'll start to make the plunger. Then he's going to pick it up on the plunger and then compress it into a cup, which is pretty hard to explain but that's why this is nice because you'll be able to see exactly how it's done and I won't have to try to put it, the process into words. You'll be able to see what happens. It's a pretty exciting process. So using that torch to heat just the middle, give the middle a little extra heat. We can tell the temperature of the glass roughly by the color by the way it starts to move, by the color. And so you might have seen it kind of glowing a little brighter orange when you use that torch right in the center. And they'll go around, squeeze it a few times. They've got it nice and round. He's, he's drawn a circle on the board. I don't know if you can see it. And so he has that to use as reference as well. There we go, thanks. I'm back into the oven. So we will take questions from the crowd if anyone has any, if you're curious about anything. Yeah? Question. Let me come out there. I heard show. Did you enjoy your time on the show or was it stressful? I think it was probably both. <laughs> I, even if he enjoyed it, I think it was probably a little stressful. Let's see, once this goes back in the oven. 
Yanush, did you enjoy your time on the show and was it stressful? Right. But did you did you enjoy the show? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, he enjoyed the show and he said it was as stressful until he was blowing glass and then it wasn't stressful. Cuz that's what he's used to, you know, you're um I think the waiting and maybe filming some of the you know, they did a we went up for the final episode. We got a little taste of what it was like. Um, for them filming for, I don't know, what, the three months that they filmed? Because there was a lot of times where they would ha they'd film you walking in, and then you'd have to stand there for half an hour or 45 minutes until they got the right shot. And then they'd have you walk out, and then have you walk back in and film just you standing there. And so before they even got any of the glass blowing, when, you know, when they were introducing the challenges and then... Um, doing all this other filming, that was probably pretty stressful. And then thinking of, like, what am I going to make? Because I don't think they got much time. I think they were given a challenge, and I think maybe sometimes they got an overnight to think about what they were going to make. But it all had to be done pretty, pretty quickly on the fly. And so um, he said, yeah, it was not stressful when he got in the shop. Because that's what he's used to doing. He, you know, you're used to being a glassmaker. You're used to the process. It was probably a little stressful not working with the same team every time and working with somebody new because they had assistance from a um, college up in um, Toronto, Sheridan College, and so they had a different college student every every um, challenge, and so that might have been a little stressful not knowing who you're going to work with and if they've ever worked with um, the process that you're working with. Where was it filmed? Up in um, uh, Canada, outside Toronto. Not at the college, no. No, it was a, it's a hot shop built just for um, the show. And they call it the largest hot shop in North America, which I believe it is. It had... 10 reheating ovens or glory holes. And it was a very large um, space built just for the show. And so it's actually a, um, it's a set. They made it look like an old glass factory, but it was not. And so they did an amazing job making it look like um, an old glass factory or an old glass works. Hi. Okay, we'll ask him when he's ready. The question was, was the show what he expected once it was all put together, once the filming was done, was the show what he was expected? And I can answer, I can answer this for myself. I, I know you weren't asking me, but <laughs> I can t give you a little insight um, of when we were filming. Because they, we've got Eric here on the floor filming what's going on, and they had... Um, I don't know, tw how many camera guys were there, Eric? It was like tw 10, no. Probably about 10, eight to 10, yeah. And um, they had these big monitors on the camera so we could see the shots that they were taking. And they were the most beautifully filmed shots. Like they were zooming in and getting these really beautiful, high quality images of this process, and so we were really impressed. And we thought, you know, at that moment, we thought, this is gonna be something, this is amazing. It's not just like, you know, a random camera angle, it's, they were, you know, filming on those cameras that move and zoom in and do all sorts of fun things. I don't know all the terms, you'll have to <laughs> the cameras that zoom in and move and, but uh, I, I'm gonna have to wait till he's, um, Maybe on the second gather, I can ask him what he thinks. Yanush, the question was, after everything was put together, all, after all the filming and you saw the show, was it um, what you had expected? Yeah, the, 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 whole, the whole production crew were really friendly and open with it. 
Yeah, he said the show looked great. He said he had a lot of interaction between the crew while they were working, and um, he had kind of learned what they were had planned and what they were going to do. And he said he was um, very impressed with the the crew. And as as were we, um, everyone was really great to work for. And Just an excellent uh, production company. All right, so he's starting a little bubble over here. This is the little bit of glass blowing that you'll see today. He just started a bubble in some clear glass by filling the pipe with air and trapping the air in there with his thumb, the blow and cap method. And the show blown away, they did a nice little um, kind of preview commercial where it was just like everybody blowing and capping and you would just hear this um, and I think because they were all mic'd up and you could hear all these noises it's um it was a really cool compilation of everybody capping a bubble and so that was kind of a fun little video that they put out before the show aired so this is enough glass to make a pretty small plunder as you can see, we're going to need quite a big plunger. So he's going to have to gather a little bit more glass. So he's letting this cool off. I'll grab him. So there's our starter bubble. He'll go in, he'll gather out another layer of glass. He'll sit down at the bench and he'll use um, a wooden tool called a block to shape, center, and cool the glass. This is one thing um, that you find in glass shops. It's pretty common, except for they did not have any blocks on the show. So they had to use the paper and the marver. So each bench would have needed probably about six or eight set of blocks. You have a small one for your first gather and then everything up to a very large size. And so they just didn't have all those sets of blocks. And so the glassmakers had to work without using the blocks, which is possible. Probably just not what they're used to. So he's going to blow that up a little further. These guys are kind of just in a they're just going to keep the whole thing nice and warm, nice and soft until Yunusha is ready and he's got the right size plunger and he's got that all shaped up. Here he'll use that newspaper. So you can use the local newspaper, fold it up, soaked in water, right in the palm of your hand. It's a really nice uh, way to shape the hot glass as well. What's that? How many issues of newspaper did they use for the show? Well, I'd say I would say probably because they you had to you kind of have to replace them every so every couple of days because they're soaked in water and they become soggy. So I bet they used a lot of newspaper. Yep, I think we've gone through quite a bit since Yunish has been here. Um, just because they don't last very long, they've become very flimsy because they're soaked in water. So you do have to replace them quite often. And they don't, um, actually, this is probably one we should have gotten rid of. How'd it work? This is one we kind of pushed. Nicely seasoned. <laughs> Nicely seasoned. 
This one kind of fell apart a couple of days ago, and we kind of pulled it back together. But it's just a big, thick. Do you want one of those other ones from the other bench? This is fine. So put a little bit of water on it. The glossy pages? Um, I don't think we've ever, no, because you have to lay it out sheet by sheet. You usually take out those glossy pages. Yep. I'm sure somebody has, or somebody wasn't told that you should take out the glossy pages. But everybody is very, um, everyone makes a paper differently. Everyone uses different paper. There's some people that only like the, just the plain newsprint with no print on it. There's some people that like certain newspapers because they use a high quality paper. Um, there's probably some that don't use the comics because there's a lot of colored ink. So it's pretty much personal preference. Now we get asked a lot, uh, do these pipes get hot? And they certainly do. And so we have this pipe cooler and that just cools the glass off with cold water. Or cools the pipe off, sorry, with cold water. That way he can grab the pipe a little closer to the glass and has more control. So he'll shape this up into a nice big bubble and then eventually he's gonna open up the tip of it. And that's gonna allow him to open this up into a big dish or disc that will become the plunger shape. So a nice shallow bowl shape. So he'll blow it up a little further and then probably uh, with the tweezers, he'll pick a little hole in the very tip of it. We can blow that bubble up a little bit so the walls are the right thickness. He'll shape it up with the paper. Now he's going to use a little map gas to heat just the tip. So. We want to control the temperature, so we want everything to be at just the right temperature. We want the back end to be a little colder. We want the area that he's going to kind of just take those tweezers and pinch it open to be the hottest and the softest. So he goes with the tweezers. He goes in, you kind of open the tweezers, and you kind of just dig in until it becomes nice and thin. By spreading the tweezers apart, the glass becomes thinner each time. And eventually, he'll get it so thin that it will just, he'll be able to pop right through it and leave a little hole. Which seems pretty tricky, but once you learn how to do it, it's pretty, pretty uh, straightforward. So I think he just broke through. All right. So he's going to open this up. Did you get a caliper reading? Yeah. You got it over here? OK. So he measured the plate. See how big he needs to make the plunger. So he now he's going to open this up. Open this hole up to the right diameter. Nope. 
So he's going to use a set of wooden jacks called parchofis. So when you're opening a bowl or a shallow plate and you have to kind of pull the glass from the inside out, those uh, parchofis are a really nice tool to use because they, they allow you to kind of push the glass without marking it up a lot. Take a quick measurement. You can see it's already starting to look more like a plunger. And at certain points, you can get the glass hot and just start to spin a little faster. It kind of opens up with centrifugal force. You can see that's already opened up a little wider. We've got a really large plunger shape here for a very large pickup. <laughs> it's the biggest one. Should have squeezed it down a little more. <laughs> this is a big one. It'll be a nice challenge. There's not many people that do this on this scale. There's probably a lot of people that try this plunger technique, but this scale is, um, makes everything that much more difficult. But like I said, he makes this look very easy. I can assure you that what he's doing right now is not as easy as he makes it look. I mean, that's something you see with experience, you know? It's just the same, same thing with musicians and athletes. The more you practice and the more you do it, the easier it looks. All right, so he's got a nice size. They're going to take a quick flash, and he's going to take a quick flash. We're going to stick, or we're not going to stick the two together. He's going to stick the two together. This is a one-shot deal. I've got a paddle. Okay. He's going to go over. He's going to stick the plunger down. And just like that, he's picked it up. And we're going to take a little time to switch out the yoke over here. This is a really beautiful view. Kind of looks like a stained glass window. Yes, Amanda's going to get a nice picture. So you can follow along on the museum's social media pages to see what's going on, see the final pieces. We'll post them. And I'm sure Yanush will post them on his... Uh, pages as well. Him and his wife have just started a new adventure or business. Um, and so you can look for them on the internet as well. And so they'll be posting a probably a lot of these pictures as well. All right. A tight squeeze back into the oven. Looks like we're all set up there on the other bench. Okay. 
So we're going to switch over to the other hole. He uses this corn husk broom to brush away any kiln wash that might be on the piece. There's a little bit of kiln wash on that plate. So they're just cleaning that off. Okay. Got this picked up. Now it's time to turn this into the cup or the, I can't remember. You know, do you call the, the cup something else? Blank. A blank, yep. Okay. So he used these two wooden boards. This is always a great photo because when they use the wood, it creates those little embers. Makes a beautiful shot. That'll be a good one for the social media. Lots of sparks, lots of fire. <laughs> So he's heating up the, the seam where the plunger meets the plate because that's the part that we want to really fuse well together. And so a little preheat before he goes back into the oven will ensure that that is the hottest part of this piece. So it's like a little preheat. Then you go in for an overall heat, and that will uh, make this nice and soft. So Chris is turning, Anusha is pushing and uh, squeezing those two seams together. So actually Tom's even going to jump in and help out Chris because there's a lot of resistance on the glass. The more pressure you put on the glass, the more resistance it causes. That's why it's nice to have a nice big team when you work with um, large pieces of glass like this. So this, these marinis are fused together in a way, it's almost like a, a hot glass mosaic. So all these little pieces are squeezed together and fit in there perfectly. Any questions? Okay. 
So you don't always see glassmakers wearing gloves, but there are certain steps or certain times when we can use gloves. And this being one of them where he's pushing the glass with these wooden paddles and his hands are really close to that hot glass that's throwing off a lot of heat. And so throwing on a set of gloves at this point is pretty helpful. But if you were wearing, if Chris was wearing gloves, it would be really hard for him to turn the pipe. And so you don't usually see glassmakers wearing gloves unless they're, you know, outside the bench and not having to use any of the tools or turn the pipe. So you can see it's becoming less wide and it's really starting to turn into like a lower bowl shape. And eventually it's going to become a cup shape, not like a drinking cup, but like a cup that would be used to make a cup to make a blank. So this takes a little bit of compression. A lot of reheats to kind of squeeze this all together. And as he's squeezing it all together, he's making sure that there's no spaces in between the marinis and that they are fused together really well. So now at this point, he can jump in and start to take some heats. So he's going to use that paper tool again, the newspaper, to kind of squeeze and shape the glass. And then they're going to use a big steel table called a marver, which is this tool here. And they're going to roll the glass along the marver, which will compress it down pretty aggressively as well. That's a little bit of compressed air. You can blow on the very tip of this. The tip of this is the first thing in the oven and the last thing out. It's always the hottest part of the piece. So he can use that um, air to kind of cool off the tip before they go back into the oven. And that part won't get as hot. So Tom, he just had Tom blow through the pipe, and you can feel if it's closed off or if it's leaking somewhere. So he asked Tom if it was leaking, and Tom said, yeah. So now they're just going to compress that down a little further and figure out where the air is escaping. So it looks like he's going to come over to the marver. You can usually tell where a glassmaker is going to go because they usually look while they're heating. They look to see 
if the table is clear, if there's anything in the way, because he's going to come so quickly to that marver that if there's something on it and he gets all the way over there with that amount of heat, he's not going to be happy. Same thing with the bench. If they're going to go back to the bench and they're going to do something specific with like a shear or a tool, they might look to see if that shear or that tool is there and ready, not just there, but not at the bottom of the pile of the tools, right where he can grab it. And so that's something as assistants and glassmakers who are working with other glass artists, kind of these nonverbal cues that you can look out for. So now they use the torches to heat the back, or the clear plunger part, because that's the part that now has to be kind of squeezed down. So he rolls this on this cold metal table. Marveling is a pretty tricky technique. Kind of sh you're shaping something round and cylindrical on a flat, cold, flat table. So you have to keep the pipe turning and the glass from resting on the table to create flat spots, keep it nice and round. So this is like that part in the reality shows. So if I was one of the, you know, if I was Catherine Gray and I came up to him and I said, you know, how are you feeling at this point in the process? You know, he says he didn't squeeze it and compress it as much as he wanted to on the plate. So it has these little spaces towards the center of the plate. What was the plate? So the tip of that bubble, it has all these little spaces. And so he is a little worried about not getting those to squeeze together. And so if he was you know, to go back and do it all again, he would have squeezed it all down a little further and made sure that the middle was more um, squeezed together. But he'll get it. It'll squeeze right down. One second. Can you hear him? What was the question? Marvering will help fill the gaps, yeah. Because you're kind of squeezing and pressing the glass down. 
So marvering it, squeezing it, that will all, spinning really fast in the oven will not. Spinning really fast in the oven will pull the glass wide and stretch those holes out. And so you'll see them, they're turning fast now, but he's got a tool on it. But you'll see them turning nice and slow in the oven, and that will keep things from wanting to s spread or fan out. But yeah, marvering it, papering it, all of that, those things will squeeze up those little holes. Yeah. So you said it's a softer pattern. Once you start using different colors and different types of glass, okay. the glass is either softer or stiffer. And so he said this pattern, this, these colors are um, softer than what he's used uh, to making. And so um, that is an added uh, challenge. You, you get used to doing something a certain way with certain colors and then you go to try it with another color, and everything feels a little different. You have to take different f heat. Um, you have to squeeze things a little differently. And so once you start adding different colors, your process has to change a little bit. That's why beginners, they always want to use color right away. But to start off, usually an instructor will have them make lots of things out of clear because just being able to get the right shapes and the right thicknesses is hard enough when you can see the thickness. But when you start adding different colors and they move differently, then it's harder to see. And so usually, as beginners, you start off with making a lot of clear things and then slowly add in colors. And when you start adding in colors, then everything just, you go back right back to square one. You have to kind of start over and learn the whole process over again, because once you add the color, everything changes. Do you have a question? You have to wait till he's done using the torch, because it's a little hard to hear over the torch. You have a question, too, Amanda? What's up? Yes and no. <laughs> we know exactly what colors we put on the plate. It's a beautiful amber in the center of the celery shape with a copper blue, an aqua blue, a thin layer of copper blue on the outside. And I think it has some darker cane stripes, some black stripes in it. And then in between each, there's two of those, so a I'll, I'll try to get a little piece of it, if I can find out back. Um, do we know how many? Uh, we didn't count them. There's a lot. It took us. <laughs> Yanu started this a couple days ago. And then I helped him with it this morning. And we finally got it kind of all put together around noon. And there is a lot of little pieces. And I, I'm going to see if I can. Tommy, can you grab the door real quick while I run out back? Can you grab these doors real quick while I run out back? I'll see if I can grab one. We'll try to hold it up to the light. All right, so he's going to marvel that once again. I don't know how will you be able to get this, or is it too small? It's 
So there's the little marina. You can see it's sort of amber in the center, and then it's got that thin layer of copper all the way around. And so there's all these. Um, there's two of them put together with a little bit of clear in the center. It's kind of like a little hot dog. But this is how small they are. And so you can imagine how many is in there. We did not count, but there is a lot in there. So Yanush came to Corning and he was hoping to use a furnace with color in it. And so uh, we have a little color pot. And so we melted a few colors for him. We melted a beautiful amber, a nice copper blue, a gray, I think a, a green color. And so that's not something that every shop has. And so he was, you know, and he wanted to come here. He wanted to... Um, utilize this color pot that we have and be able to make these solid color pieces because usually a glass shop will keep clear in the furnace and then you have to add the color but to get that solid bit of um, amber in just the center of the marini the only really good way to do that is to have a furnace of the amber so you can see this is really compressing down to a uh, nice cup shape, yeah. What is glass? That's a great question. Glass is an unorganized solid. <laughs> it's an unorganized solid. So glass, glass is a, a what is it, a state of matter? So actually, uh, I think Jolly Ranchers are glass. Not like the glass that we think of, but um, glass is a state of matter. So you can have candy that's glass and you can have um, the glass that we're familiar with. So this type of glass that we're using is um, silica, soda ash, and limestone. So those three ingredients make our soda lime glass and it's the most common glass in the world. So I think more recently you're calling it an unorganized solid. You might have heard of glass as being an, an amorphous solid. But yeah, most glass is made of silica sand, not all glass. <laughs> I don't know if that's the answer you were looking for. No, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> glass, yes, sand, silica, silica sand, mined right out of the ground. Here, Yanush is going to use a wooden block on the floor. So he's going to roll and rotate the glass right in the block. This will compress it as well. We'll keep it nice and round. So it's like those handheld uh, blocks we were using on a stick. So we're going to put a little bit of water on that um, block just to keep it wet. Now he's going to use these steel tools called jacks to start to squeeze down the bubble. So these are, if you light the jumbo glory hole, you might 
want to have a jumbo set of jacks. So these are our largest jacks. <laughs> so they're squeezing that down. I'm gonna go back for a little heat. The glass is pretty thin, or relatively thin. It's probably a little under an inch. And so they're going to, ha the glass is gonna heat up very quickly, but it's gonna cool down just as quick. So they have a pretty short working time compared to when the glass is really thick and fresh out of the furnace. So he'll shape it in that block. So we get just the right shape. Then the next level will be to kind of cut that line in a little deeper. And we're going to punty the piece and flip it around. How much do we think the piece weighs? I have not touched the pipe, so I have no clue. Chris or Tom, you want to give us a nice guess? <laughs> it's really hard. Too much, yeah. I'll tell you, it's heavy. Um, I can tell from looking at it that it's really heavy. I, would, I know the pipe itself weighs about eight pounds because we've weighed the pipes. So the pipe weighs about eight pounds. The glass, is, there's probably about five or 10 pounds of glass, between five and 10. I would say closer to 10, so 15 pounds. But now imagine if you were to pick something up that weighs 15 pounds and hold it close to your center of gravity, it's not that heavy. But if you pick it up on the end of a pipe and you're holding it way out there, like on a shovel, so I don't, I don't know if most of you live in upstate New York, if you've ever had to shovel the driveway, but you know, a big load of snow on the end of a shovel is not light, it's pretty heavy. And so, the fact that, that all that weight is out on the end of a pipe and moving around, it's gonna feel a lot heavier than it actually is. It's gonna get a little lighter pretty soon because we're gonna break it free from the pipe that has all that clear on it. So all that clear is just part of the process. It's not part of the piece. And so it's gonna get a little lighter eventually and then eventually, when they make the actual piece out of this cup, they'll add probably two or three layers of glass on top of it. So yeah, it's a lot of glass. It's pretty heavy. Um, but that's like uh, probably the most common question. When we start working like this, people always want to know how heavy it is. And it's such a hard thing because we don't, can't put it on a scale. And we can't weigh it, so you kind of have to guess. And it always feels heavier, so you want to say it's 1,000 pounds, because that's what it feels like. But it's probably only 10 or 20, less than that. But it feels a lot heavier than it is. So again, just rolling it and shaping it, keeping everything nice and round. Yeah, this is sort of the grand finale of a long two weeks. He's been working nonstop.
for two weeks. Yeah, I need a shield too. See, my job here is to shield the glass maker, but my hand is so close, I should have thrown a glove on. So they're getting pretty close. They're probably just going to tighten this little line down. They're going to break the glass on this constriction line that he's torching right now. They'll squeeze that down a little further, and they're going to break the glass right along that line. The smaller, the tighter that line is, the easier this will break free. So they're going to add a little heat and probably squeeze that down a little further. And then the next step will be to flip the whole thing around and open up the cup shape. So he's just going to squeeze that again. So that will become the opening. And eventually, this will go on another blowpipe. So once he breaks that free, he'll take that opening. And that's what will attach to another blowpipe, but without all that clear. So we want to get rid of all that clear. So that's what this step will do by flipping it around and making the cup out of it. So this is all still prep work for the actual piece. So those, these pieces have a lot of work that goes into them. So Yanush is now going to make what's called a punty. The punty is just a little bit of glass on the end of a solid rod, which will act as glue. And it's sort of a Q-tip shape. Actually, he might do like a sculpture punty, so it might not be a Q-tip shape. Tom's drawing a chalk line. And that's going to give them a target to shoot for, so to find center. Because they want to flip this around and make sure that the piece is still on the same axis, still nice and centered. So making that little chalk line, um, which will brush off, just gives them a guide as to where to stick the punty. Otherwise, you're kind of just aiming for center, and you might you don't always hit center. So it's nice to have that little, unless you're lean, oh yeah. So the guys are going to take quick, short flash heats, which just keeps everything nice and hot. And Yanusha is making a cold core for the punty. He'll go in for a second gather of glass. So this will allow him to take a nice big punty that's kind of cool and stable in the center. He'll shape it up. They'll stick the two together. And uh, sometimes we want a punty to be a weak connection. We want it to stick and hold temporarily. We want it to easily pop off. But for this one, he wants it to be a, sort of a sculpture punty. So he wants it to stick 
more permanently. So he's actually going to stick it on there pretty hot. Nice and gooey. See how it kind of smushed right on there? And they'll kind of run the two irons together. And then he'll create this little weak line. So he's squeezing in with the jacks right now to create a constriction. That's where they're going to break the glass. And so this cup will have a little bit of clear glass left on it, which he can remove later. He'll cool it off by blowing on it. And now they're stuck together. The only thing to do is to break the glass. And they've set up that thin, weak line in order to do that. So with a few drops of cold water and a very light tap, it pops right off. The crowd goes wild for broken glass. I don't know if you've ever broken glass before, but it doesn't always happen just like that. You know, nobody applauds. So he's pretty devastating. So getting the glass to break exactly where you want it and nowhere else takes lots of experience and practice. So now they're just going to clean up the uh, front edge of this, probably remove that little bit of clear. And so he's probably going to shear it. He'll probably cut it with um, a set of shears, which is fun to see. You don't always think of glass as being something you can cut through. But when it's hot and soft like this, it's pretty easy. So Chris pulled out those shears. He's going to lay those out. Now you can see the, the color difference in the glass where it's up there at the top or the leading edge. It's glowing a nice cherry red. And it looks a little black towards the um, back where it's a little colder. So he's going to spend a little time concentrating the heat there just at the top. We're pretty much finished with the bottom. We don't really want that to move too much. So he's going to heat just the top. So they're going to use that bench block again. So they lay it out, put a little bit of spread the water around a little bit. You can just turn the glass in the block. Just going to heat the top. He told Chris no flash, which means don't go all the way in. Just heat the very top. There's a nice view. You can see all those little marinis, those celery-shaped marinis with the little dot in the center. Almost looks like a type of coral. So here he goes. He's going to go in there and he's going to sh cut through the glass just like it was paper. Tom is using a set of boards to shield his hand from the heat.
we had a glass blower that used to work with us, and he would always say, if you've ever wondered what it's like to cut through hot glass, go home, take a set of shears and an orange peel, cut through the orange peel, but if you really want the real, the real deal, have your friend hold a hair dryer pointed at your fingers as you're cutting, and that's exactly what it feels like to cut through hot glass, and it's pretty accurate. You're, it's kind of spongy, and your hands get so hot as you're cutting that it's almost unbearable. But you have to keep cutting. So he'll shape that up. Tom's going to help him out with a wooden board. They're going to paddle the lip. And that'll just make sure that the lip stays nice and straight. And this is the cup shape that we're looking for. Like I said, it's not a drinking cup. It's just a cup with all the color on it. And then eventually, he can warm this up in an oven and pick it up on a blowpipe, and that will become the bubble. So he could actually attach a, if he if he wanted to work, you know, through the night. He could get a blowpipe right now, put a collar on it, stick it up, gather over it a few times, and by nine o'clock tonight we could have a nice big piece. But um, I think for this uh, demo, I think he's finished, and we're gonna put this away into a slow cooling oven. And so to do that, Tom's putting on a silver suit because he's going to stick his arms and face into. Yeah, if you guys want to come, don't, um, uh, don't run down the stairs, but come down and look. If you want to come down closer to the glass, you know she's going to bring this over and you can see the, uh, the piece. You'll be able to feel the heat coming right off of it. <laughs> it's hot, isn't it? This is the up close. <laughs> it's very hot. You don't want to reach out and touch it. There's a nice close up shot for you. It's probably even a little too hot. If you threw a, a popcorn kernel in there right now, it's probably even a little too hot to pop. To, it would burn the popcorn pretty quick. So if, there's some times where you can pop popcorn in a, a shape like this, and it would have to be a little colder even now. So even though it is very hot, it's not quite cold enough. It's still very hot. All right, we're going to put this away. Tom's going to grab a hold of it with a set of gloves and with a very light tap. A few drops of cold water and a light tap. This will pop right off and into our oven where we can get a closer look at that beautiful piece that will soon become a whole nother piece tomorrow morning. Janusz Pozniak, everyone. <laughs> and a beautiful blank for an upcoming piece. And so ch maybe check out his social media. Here's a closer look at one of these um, blanks. You can see with the light coming through that. Wow, that's beautiful. That's a pretty similar color. That one is uh, gray and orange, I believe. Really nice. <laughs> 